understand what you are yeah. saying. Yeah. I think my my own uh, thinking is that perhaps one of the consideration was it was easier because even this group was was all white Briton mm. except one. There mm. was one yeah. Afro Caribbean guy uh, was working in with on the ship mm. as as the ships were sailing around mm. South Africa and then they would stop in Deben. But even with him, I think his mission ended in in because I think they would have been a bit sensitive that yeah the the regime mm. would have picked up any uh, black person mm. would have paid special attention whereas if mm. you were white mm. I mean given their own uh, mm. um, uh, racism I mean if you're mm. white they would mm. have probably ignore you even at a roadblock a thing yeah. like that yeah. you would be you left can, to can, pass can fly yeah. under the radar if, yeah. you're, if, you're, if you're white yes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas, I mean, for, I think, Afro-Caribbeans, it would have been a bit difficult, you know, once you set foot, especially if you were a foreign black mm. uh, during those days. I mean, the apartheid regime even mm. paid more attention to you, yeah. just in case you contaminate yeah. our local blacks, yeah. you know, yeah. with all your ideas and what have you. So, uh, so, so I understand, but I, I can understand the disappointment because yeah. I, I'm sure a lot of, at that age, you want to fight, you you want to volunteer, and then suddenly nobody's explaining to you, you know, why you're not being accepted mm. to volunteer. Uh, there's another thing I was reading in the book uh, called, mm. it, 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 they uh, call it the Four Pillars of Struggle. Mm. Uh, I thought that was uh, quite interesting. Um, I should have highlighted it here, mm. but let me let me just get to it. So four pillars of struggle. Uh, these were the political mass struggle of the people. The, the, there was the armed operations. Uh, there was the um, um, uh, uh, well, uh, the armed operations, of course, like the both you know the, the guns and all the rest of that stuff. Um, then there was the organi uh, 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 underground organizations, which included propaganda. Mm -hmm. Right, and then there's the international support was the four pillars, mm -hmm. you know, that, that that they talk about. Now I'm bringing that up only because uh, Shepi, now you was a student activist. Uh, mm -hmm. well, I they even say you was a student leader. What what is this? Or did you did you have these kind of principles, or were, were, were you all just fighting? What age did you start being a student leader or activist or whatever? Yeah. I'd say, uh, perhaps, I mean, uh, let me just pick it up with talking about these four pillars. There was a, there was a, a somebody I worked with uh, uh, at, at some point formally in an organization in, at UWC called ERIP, Education Resource Information Pro Project. Um, his name is Marie Michel, and he is now, he heads the uh, fiscal, uh, what is it, not a fiscal, the, the uh, financial intelligence center in in, uh, in uh, Pretoria. Anyway, so Mari had an interesting encounter one day talking about these four pillars of struggle. He was running a workshop in outside Cape Town, one of the smaller towns, I think was closer to Worcester, between Pal and Worcester. And he's running a workshop and one of the young activists came to him and he said, Comrade Mari. And he's animated in a discussion with a group of people and he keeps arguing and whatever and then eventually they came to Mari to drag him to come and bring him here. So I'm trying to tell this Congress about the four caterpillars of struggle. Can we tell them? And Mari, Mari realized that, oh, okay, so he spoke, spoke, explained to them, said, oh, okay, the four pillars of struggle are this and this. And the Congress turned back when Mari said, thanks, thank you. I've been telling you, it's the four caterpillars of struggle. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but I, I I got involved. I mean, in, in uh, as we're growing up, I mean, you you could not avoid to at some point in your own uh, life uh, to be aware of 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 apartheid, you know, and the reality of the country. And that awareness sometimes came very early on, you know, just through seeing the contrast between your own life and the life of that white people led, you know, on the other side of the railway line. And incidentally, in all, in most townships, there was always a railway line that separated white suburbs from from black townships. Yeah. So um, and and once I I got exposed to that, and it it just you know it was an early kind of conscientization, and and. Then 
then of course, I mean, in, in my own family. There when were, you say early, what, what, about what age did that revelation yes, come to? Yes, like I, I, about at the age of 12 and 13, mm -hmm. I was working already in the, as a garden boy, so-called garden boy, in white suburbs. And you know, you could see I was uh, quite aware of the type of lifestyles that uh, white people led as opposed to the type of lifestyle that I returned to every evening. I mean, I would come from school, of course, I was still at school, would come from school in the afternoon and go and work in the garden and and that uh, and that really uh, you know for me uh, the, the work itself really helped me I mean it formed me into the person I am today because I learned very early on you know to fend for yourself and earn an income and that sort of thing and then of course I used to do golf course as well and in even in the golf course you know there was this kind of contrast you when you say golf would you would you landscaping or would you no I was a caddy it was a caddy, a caddy okay. yeah, at, at the golf course and a, a lot of us a lot of my generation were caddies that would play dice you know I mean, we used to gamble, play dice uh, with our uh, earnings in order to, of course, with the with the hope that you um, you gamble with the hope that you will you will make more money through dice. Anyway, and then uh, and and by about. Uh, 1975, and then I was doing standard six uh, in that year. When I say standard six, what, 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 what do you mean? What, 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 what grade is that? It's grade eight nowadays. Grade, yeah. Uh, what? Uh, what's the age range? Uh, yes, like man, it's grade eight. It would be about 60, 15, 16. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that age group. We would say junior high school, high school now in the states, yeah. but wherever. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then that's that's when they they impose uh, uh, Africans. I mean, up until uh, standard three, we were doing. We, in fact, from from grade one, we were taught in our own language, and then grade two, they introduced the second languages, which was Africans and English. Mm -hmm. And then we, those days, they were called sub A and sub B. So from sub B, then you went to standard one, which is grade three, and by standard one, then gradually you get introduced to uh, more and more English but essentially you're still doing uh, some Africans and you're doing is Kosa as well as, as, a, as a mother tongue and a medium of instruction but it would change gradually into English so by the time you're grade four mm -hmm. you had already been inducted into English as a medium of instruction by about grade uh, grade five grade six um, grade seven this is fully English now and then grade and then and in that year then we change to grade eight and then suddenly they change all the rules you know it's like overnight basically you know like now all your subjects must be in Afrikaans except uh, it's a course which you do in English as a language mm -hmm. um, and it course is course as a language and that really created uh, the basis for the 1976 uprising because uh, it just created turmoil. I mean, I, I can uh, even vividly recollect how my own teachers used to struggle because now they have to teach physical science in Africans. Uh, I think it was called Vesque, or the mathematics as Veskende. And uh, then there was agriculture, there was, uh, because we, we uh, even then we still did agriculture, Langbo, now it's called Langbo. And you know, you had to grapple with concepts and new concepts mm -hmm. of uh, that you used to teach and were fluent in them in English. And now, now you suddenly, it's a new language and you have to learn this language and understand these concepts. And it just created turmoil that year. And that was the year in which the uprising took place eventually. So that really, I mean, for me, that that experience sort of propelled me into into activism. Yeah. Mm -hmm.